I think I'm ready to begin my extreme detailing experiment on this 240D. If you remember last week, I showed you what the engine looked like. You know, there's a lot of little rust spots. There's corrosion. It, it's clean. I mean, it's really clean. There's no oil, but it doesn't look that attractive because there's all these little flaws. And I found with any detailing, it's in the details. You get the pun. You go around and you clean up every single thing that your eye catches. And eventually when you're done, you're going to go, wow, that looks like brand new, even though it's not brand new. It's really you're fooling your eye. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate in this series of videos on this 240D. I'm going to show you some good before pictures, and then I'll take you through the process. We'll do some fast motion on the camera so you don't have to see every single thing I do, but you'll get a good feel for what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And I want to take you back and show you those scenes that I shot last week to kind of give you an idea once again of what this engine looks like up close. First off, you'll notice I've removed the hood. You know, this is not a W123 chassis. The hood does not go up vertical. On these old 114 and 115s, the hood's about like this. So you can imagine all the work that I'm going to be doing in here is kind of a pain with that hood in the way. And I know you're thinking, well, it's a lot of work to take the hood off. No, it's not. <laughs> not when you consider how much time you will save when you do this type of work. Now, just a quick pointer, okay? When you do take the hood off, Always, and I repeat, always use a helper. Never try to remove one of these hoods yourself. The most critical part are the corners. When they drop, they're going to hit right here on this cowling or on the outer part of this fender, and you're going to end up with some dents and some rather gouged paint. So as a safety precaution, get a couple pieces of dense foam like this and shove underneath the two corners of the hood and then start loosening up the bolts, get all the bolts loose, take all but one out on each side, and then get your helper to get on one side, you get on the other side, and then lift the hood free and clear. And put it in a safe place, by the way, so it doesn't get beat up while you're doing all this work. So what I'm going to have to do to begin is I'm going to have to remove the fuel injectors and the glow plugs so I get good access in and around this engine. Yes, the fuel injectors are rusty and the glow plugs are rusty. And there's a lot of cor corrosion on the valve cover. So I'm going to go ahead and pull the valve cover and do a valve adjustment. So while I'm doing all this detailing, I'm basically going to remove the fuel injectors, put them on the bench tester, test them. If they're not okay, I'll rebuild them. I'm going to install the fast glow upgrades on this so I don't have to worry about cleaning up those rusty glow plugs. Then I can get down in here and do some real nice painting. Of course, I'm going to have to do this by hand with a brush. And the same over here on the front of the engine. I'll probably take some of the coolant out of the engine and we're going to paint the front of the engine here. And you look over here, we've got the brake booster and the master cylinder. We'll do some touch up on that, cleaning off this brass valve assembly, cleaning all the hoses. We've got various fasteners you can see here that are rusty. And those are going to be treated and coated with a special sealant. We're going to begin now by removing these fuel injectors and glow plugs. When I tackle a job like this, let's say it takes more than about a half a dozen tools, I prefer to take this rolling tray of mine, roll it right up to the toolbox, and load all the tools on that I'm going to need. I just kind of mentally go through the job in my mind because it saves time of constantly going back and forth to the toolbox. Well, you can see it's going to take quite a few tools to do this. I've got, you know, some standard wrenches and sockets, but I also have some specialty tools here. Now, I'm not going to narrate this. You'll just get to watch and we'll kind of speed this up as I go through the process of removing the fuel injectors and the glow plug.
Right now, before I do anything else, I'm going to take a good close look at these glow plugs as well as the injectors to give me an idea of anything that's going wrong inside the engine. These glow plugs look pretty normal. There's no excessive oil. You don't have a lot of uh, deforming on these wires. So I'm just keeping them in order while I inspect them. I see nothing abnormal here. But while I'm at it, I think I'll go ahead and just ream out the carbon in the pre-chambers. We have a special reamer that we make right here in my shop. We're going to stick this reamer in and see if we get, look at, yeah, we're getting a little bit of carbon. I can feel it. Now, if it's real bad, what I'll do is I'll take and put a little grease on the flutes of this reamer. Okay, it's, it's binding up in there. I think we'll go ahead and back this back out. Okay, see, you can see the carpet I'm picking up. So I think what I'll do, I'll wipe this off and I'm going to put some grease on there. So any excessive carbon will be picked up by the grease. I'm just using a little synthetic grease here. Just wipe it into the flutes of the reamer. Okay, let's go back in here. All right, see it's binding up a little bit. You have to be careful, don't force it. If you're having to put a lot of torque on the wrench, there's something wrong. You just want to lightly tighten this down until it goes down and stops, and then you're done. I can see the reamer down in the pre-chamber. Okay, let's take the reamer out. See how much carbon we got here. That's not too bad. Go ahead and put it into number three here. If you can turn it all the way in by hand, and then that's a good indication that your engine's not been burning a lot of oil because it's usually excess oil burning that causes the pre-chambers to coke up excessively. It can also happen with an extremely rich mixture, but I found the, the excess oil in the cylinders tends to cause the buildup more than anything else. Okay, number three looks okay. I'll go ahead and do number one and number two. Put a little more synthetic grease on there. We'll do these front two. And then we're going to come back and we'll take a close look at those fuel injectors. I thought I'd show you the results from number two cylinder. It had quite a bit more carbon, so I wanted you to see this. You can see the buildup of the carbon between the flutes. You see the advantage of using the synthetic grease when using this reamer. But this is a really good idea to do this. Anytime you have your glow plugs out, I highly recommend you ream out the carbon. Uh, we're very proud of this tool that we make here right in our own shop. So take a look. You know, they're a little rusty. They've been sitting in the car for a while. But a couple things that are very important to note. Number one is it took an extreme amount of torque to remove them. These injectors were over tightened. And I harp on this all the time. If you over tighten these injectors, you're going to put excessive pressure on the nozzle and it can actually hang up in there. That's one of the things that causes nailing or rattling. Now I've seen these tighten so much that the injector nozzles will actually overheat. So that's something you want to watch. They need to be torqued properly and you need to use a torque wrench. You can see there's a little bit of carbon coking around the tip and that's normal. But take a look at number two. And you're thinking, Kent, why is that all black and carboned up? <laughs> and that's the first thing I thought. What's going on with number two? This is probably the original heat shield. You can see what happens when you try to install a fuel injector and reuse an old heat shield washer. You're not going to get a proper seal. You're going to get a poor burn and possible injection compression leak. So that's something you want to watch out for. Now I'm going to take a quick look and determine whether or not I should even bother bench testing these. And the way you can do that is to clean the tip and see if there's any burn uh, burning around the face. Now the way to do that is to use a brass tool. We offer a brass injector cleaning kit. We call it our top brass kit. And when you're working with these diesel fuel injectors, 
you only want to clean the parts with brass, not steel. You don't want to use steel brushes on them because you'll score them. These are really critical. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to scrape the carbon off the tip. I'm just being very careful. I can feel the end of the pintle that sticks through that nozzle housing. Right there, you can see how that's burned away and there's actually almost looks like scoring in a round circle real close to the tip there. That's probably the reason these look a little carboned up and coked like this. It's because they probably have been dripping fuel. They haven't been seating properly. So what I'm going to do now, because of the condition of these tips, I'm not even going to bother bench testing them to see if they're OK. I'm going to go ahead. We're going to take these back in the shop, and we're going to rebuild them with new Monarch nozzles. Right here, folks. These are my favorite tools this week. I just completed a rather tedious repair of a leaking breather cover in an M113 engine. And these plastic razor blades really came in handy. You know, they've made some great improvements in these. I remember about 15 years ago when I bought a plastic razor blade. It wasn't all that good, but some of these now have some really nice sharp edges and they can fit in a razor blade holder so you can actually use it as a scraper. Now granted these don't last very long but they are really good in certain applications particularly for like cleaning pitch and other contaminants off automotive glass. They also work <laughs> as you've already seen for getting into the critical areas on sealing surfaces on magnesium and aluminum engine parts. Now this style right here is not as sharp. It's got a blunt edge and it has rounded corners right here so that you can kind of work this into areas you really want to protect from any type of scratching at all. But I, I've become really fond of plastic razor blades and they should be in every toolbox. Let me show you a couple kits we're going to, to offer on my website in case you don't have these. We offer an inexpensive 10 pack of these plastic razor blades, seven of the sharp edge and three of these rounded corner blunt edge blades that you see here. Th these are very inexpensive and you, sh you should have them. You should have them right in your toolbox. And then along with that, I offer a complete you know, gasket prep kit, which includes these 10 blades, an assortment of 1200 to 2000 grit wet or dry sandpaper, a scotch bright pad, and then I put in about half ounce or a little less of my favorite gasket sealant for paper gasket. This is Aviation Permatex here. So if you need a kit to help you prep for sealing metal surfaces or preparing surfaces for gaskets and you want to protect them from scratching and you want to do the job right, this is what you're going to need right here. Newly acquired this week, let me introduce you to the newest member of my fleet, Ms. Mercedes. Now that's the name that the previous owner of 17 years gave this car, and I'm going to keep that name. I tend to name all my Mercedes Benzes, but let me tell you, this is one sweetheart. It's a super Ms. Mercedes, okay? I don't think I've ever purchased a 20-year-old Mercedes-Benz in this nice condition. Take a look at the interior. It's almost flawless. I mean, there's a, like a couple little cracks in the wood surround over the gear shift knob. There's no door dings in the car. The paint is immaculate. It has 115,000 miles on it. And the engine, now well, it's going to need a little detailing. There's a few things, of course that are gonna to need to be done to this car. It's kind of interesting. We're gonna to have to do a 2,000 hour inspection on this probably in the next couple of weeks. So we'll continue that series too. But I thought it would really be a good opportunity to do a new series. I'm going to title it Buying a 1986 to 1995 Mercedes-Benz. This is kind of a unique era. There's a lot of nice cars still out there as evidenced right here. You know, if you know how to look and you know what to look for, so over the next month, I'm going to be doing this long, long series on buying these cars. I particularly, you know, just love the W124. We have a 300 SE W126 and a W140 500 SEL and a 300 SDL. I've got a R129 300 SL. I currently don't have any more 190Es. And I don't have a couple of the other chassis, but I'll be trying to acquire those or get my hands on them as I go through this series. Now, this series won't be part of the Kent's Garage episodes. It will be something that is separate from it. In this episode tonight, I just wanted to introduce you to my new baby. 
Now for the questions of the week, I'm going to start out by addressing a couple questions that came in related to the same subject, and that's these LED dash lights that I sell. They pretty much were asking, well, are they dimmable? Can you use the dimmer switch to brighten them and dim them down? The other question was, well, are these white or are they yellow? And we've all been around LED lights. You know, they're kind of taking over the world right now. But, you know, I've recently found some really nice ones for my house because I do not like that bright blue, white, cool color. And a lot of the LEDs are coming out with a lot more warmer, kind of a yellowish cast to them. So I think there's improvements on the horizon. Right now, I'm gonna show you a comparison. I've hooked these up, both bulbs, to a 123 instrument cluster that I put on the bench. You can see right away, when I power them up, the LED is five times brighter. You can see that little dim stock bulb there off to the left. And yes, they are dimmable. But you gotta remember that the LED is so bright that when you dim it, it's not really dimming way down like you would with the stock bulb. So we're gonna keep researching and see if we can't come up with a cool white, kind of a warm white bulb that can be a replacement for these dash lights. And I think that'll probably happen down the road, but we'll keep you advised. Okay, next question. He, this uh, viewer says, I can't wait to see the video on the W115 chassis. He says, any chance you can touch on the problem specific to the older OM616 and OM617 engines on that chassis. But I just wanna to address two, two which I feel are major improvements when they developed the W123 is number one, they move the oil filter housing up top where you can access it from above. And they also took the power steering pump and moved it up top. Now that old 240D over there, it's a tough one to change the oil. I've seen a lot of damage if you don't know how to change the oil on one of these, it's fraught with some risk, let me tell you. And I've done an on-demand video, it's available on my website, if you wanna learn more about doing an oil change on those older diesels, because you can damage the can and the housing very easily. So this is kind of a challenge. The other thing is, the power steering pumps on these engines are constantly loosening up. And that's one of the things I'm gonna check on my 240D over there, probably Sometime down the road here in one of these episodes, we'll take a look at that and see if it has starting to loosen up. But I do not like the location of the power steering pump, and I do not like the location of the oil filter on those older engines. So congratulations to the engineers of the W123. They took those two problems and made some big improvements. Okay, next question. He says, I have a W208 chassis with a 113 engine. It has over 223,000 miles on it. Can you please tell me what type of motor oil to use and what type of spark plugs to use? Okay, this is another kind of opinion question. I'm just going to address a couple things here. Anytime you wanna find out what the factory recommends, it's not difficult. And I only recommend the factory recommended spark plugs for these engines. Don't go off and put some sort of platinum super plug in there or something that someone says is the best thing since sliced bread because they don't work so well. So you use the factory recommended plugs and I'm gonna give you a little homework, just Google it and you'll find it very quickly. As far as oil, you wanna use the oil that you've been using all along. You know, if you've been using synthetic oil, you wanna keep using synthetic oil. Now, as an engine gets that kind of mileage on it, you want to increase the viscosity. Instead of a 540, you might wanna go with a 550. It'll, it depends a lot on how much that engine is burning oil, but you just don't keep using thin oil through the whole life of the engine. I've always felt that once an engine gets to around 120, 130,000 miles, I start upping the viscosity. As most of those clearances in the bearings and piston rings and so on continue to wear, then I like a little thicker oil. And that, of course, is my opinion. There, here's another one from Mark. He says, great videos, Kent. I have a 1989 300TE with 516,000 miles. Way to go, Mark. Uh, did you put all those on yourself? And he says he's got a shaking speedometer needle. I mean, you know, we've seen this where you drive down the road, the needle's kind of like shaking, <laughs> jumping around a little bit. Well, what's causing this? He wants to know what he can do to fix the problem. Well, it, it's either going to be a cable or it's gonna be the speedometer itself. And it, it's one of those things you don't really wanna throw money at until you figure out what the problem is. Now, what I've learned is you can pull the cluster out and remove the speedometer cable and shoot some lubricant down in there. Don't use WD-40. Use something like a roller bearing, 
uh, oil or uh, chain lube, something that has some viscosity that'll kind of weep down in the cable housing and lubricate the cable and then drive the car again. If there's no improvement at all, it's probably the speedometer. So, uh, you know, you're going to have to decide, okay, is it the cable speedometer? Do that test, and if you get an improvement, then you might want to go ahead and get a new speedometer cable and replace it. Because a lot of times, oiling these speedometer cables up is only a temporary fix. At least that's been my experience. If you have to go after Rebuilding your speedometer, I recommend you send it out to Overseas Speedometer. You can just Google it, www.overseasspeedometer.com. Okay. Here's the next question. I have a W123 1981-240D with a manual transmission. It has 315,000 miles. Way to go, you guys. You're out there really driving these old Mercedes. And I would like to change the rear end to a lower RPM while driving down the freeway. Any ideas as to what I might use and how difficult a job is this? Since your car has a manual transmission, I would recommend you try to find a 1985 model W123 rear end. They lower the ratio down to 2.88, and that makes a wonderful car. If you can install it, it's not real difficult, but it is time consuming. If you have a lot of rust in your car, it can be really tough getting to a lot of the bolts. I'm sorry I don't have any videos on rear end replacement, but I'm sure you can Google that too and find out additional information that'll help you replace the rear differential. And this last question is from Joshua. He has a short question. It says, fuel's going to the fuel distributor, plenty of pressure, there is no fuel going to the cylinders, 90, 300E 2.6. Okay, the question is short and sweet, but there's really not enough information there to answer it. This could be a number of different things that are causing this. And when I get a question like this, I need to get some background so I know how to advise. So Joshua, if, you're, if you see this, I need to know a couple things. Number one, when you say no pressure, what do you mean? Uh, are you, do you have gauges on it? Are you testing the pressure with gauges? And when you say no fuel going to the cylinders, please expound upon that. You mean you have no fuel spraying out of the fuel injectors? And then finally, I need to know a little history of the car. Was the car sitting for a long time? Or is this something that just happened while you were driving the car, it suddenly quit, and you found you were getting no fuel to the fuel inject? Post those replies, and I'll try to help you on the next round, OK? So now, let's get back to the 240D over there. You know, we're already uh, about to the end <laughs> of this particular episode, and I'm nowhere near finished with the old 240D. So this is probably going to continue on into the next episode. Let me take you over to that car and kind of show you where I am today. I think I'm ready to really start detailing the engine compartment in this 240D. Yesterday, I removed the air filter assembly. That's gonna give me better access to that inner fender panel over on that side. I removed the fan shroud and the fan. That's gonna give me better access in here to the front of the engine. I loosen up this fuel filter and set it off to the side because I'm going to be painting the engine block. <laughs> That's going to be fun. <laughs> you know, we're going to do that in the next few days, so you'll get to see some of that next week. And of course, getting the battery out of the way is going to give me access right in here as we tackle cleaning up and painting the booster and the master cylinder and getting down in here and detailing a lot of the corrosion that you have seen on this engine. So we're going to keep working this next week, and when we come back next week, you're going to get to see a little bit of a change, and I'll kind of show you how we did some of these things. If you find these episodes helpful and like to see them continue, I would ask that you donate to my fan funding account. There's a link right on the main page to my channel. You'll see a support tab right on the right side. So we're going to roll up our sleeves here, and I'm going to keep working into the wee hours, and I want to wish every one of you Happy Halloween. We'll see you next week.